Hello and welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host Juma Iraqi and joining me today is Kamal Patel and the topic we're going to talk about is fructose. Hi Kamal, how are you doing? I'm doing good, how about you? I'm doing perfect. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this um, podcast and before we go into the questions, uh, for people that not, might not know you, could you give us an introduction about yourself? Sure. So um, I live in San Francisco, California. Uh, before this podcast, uh, Juma and I were talking about how it's cold there in Norway. It's cold here where I live too. I live by the beach, which is the chilliest part of the West Coast in the U.S., so it's always windy and chilly. But um, other than meaning that I don't get much vitamin D from going outside, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's a good place to do nutrition research. There's always a lot of good stuff happening here, University of Berkeley and Stanford and that kind of thing. Uh, personally, I'm the director of examine.com. Um, I've been involved in nutrition research and was a wannabe powerlifter uh, about a, a decade and a half ago. Um, and uh, currently, I just read studies all day and kind of put the data together. And uh, I'm here to talk about fructose because a research group I was in published a meta-analysis of fructose a couple of years ago. Excellent. And I'm really looking forward because this is a topic that there seems to be a lot of uh, misconception in regards to um, fructose. So I'm really, really looking forward and I really appreciate that you are taking the time to do this podcast. So... Can you briefly just explain what, what fructose is for the people that might not know what we're talking about? Sure. So um, everybody knows sugar. Sugar is sucrose, uh, disaccharide. The three main monosaccharides um, that make up other sugars are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Um, so fructose looks just like glucose. It's a, It has six carbons, so it's a hexose sugar. Um, DNA is a pentose sugar. I don't know if anybody watches Game of Thrones, but I think pentose is on there as a as a city in the east. Um, but pentose sugars don't come up much in nutrition because we can eat DNA and it might actually have some health effects, but we don't eat it in great enough quantities. In contrast, we eat a lot of glucose and fructose, which is why it's it's such a hot research issue. Um, so fructose differs in glucose and that uh, just in one spot. Um, it's got a, a keto group attached to the carbon instead of uh, aldehyde group. Um, and because of the slightly different structure, even though it has the same molecular formula, it has different functions in the body, completely different. So glucose is essential. Um, that's kind of skirting the issue that some uh, some people, even researchers like Tim Noakes, um, do a lot of athletic activity under ketogenic diets and don't really use glucose much either for uh, fueling their muscle or brain. But for 99.999% of people, glucose is essential. And if you get less than around, let's say, 50 grams of glucose a day, you're going to start running low and uh, either burning some muscle, um, using some fat byproducts or you know what have you. If you get below 100 or 150 grams of glucose a day, uh, then you might have more kind of subclinical issues over time. So glucose is essential. We've established that. Fructose is not essential for anything. Um, fructose does uh, provide fuel for your sperm to swim. So sperm motility depends on fructose. But I don't think you have to eat fru fructose for that to happen. Um, and actually, there's not a lot known about uh, fructose health effects. You might think because there's been so many studies that, that everything is known. It's not true. In fact, um, when we were doing our research, uh, some kind of physician focus groups we talked to either didn't know much about fructose or sometimes they would, you know, hear the word fructose and they wouldn't even recognize it. Like, oh, is it fructose? Is it fructose? Is it fructose? Um, you know, people know a lot about fats and glucose and starch, but not a ton about fructose. So um, I guess we'll talk more about uh, how fructose is dealt with in the body a bit later on. But the key point is that we have to have a constant low level of glucose in our blood and not only do we not have to have a constant low level of fructose in our blood, but our body doesn't want us to have fructose in our blood. So it's completely different. The only other place you'll really see fructose is um, fructans are chains of fructose that are um, sometimes not well digested by people, uh, but also can beneficially fuel um, certain uh, bacteria in the gut. So for some people, certain types of fructans um, 
like FOS um, are good for you and for others it causes stomach upset. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, a recent podcast that I actually did uh, with uh, Cassandra Forsat where we actually talked about irritable bowel syndrome and uh, FODMAPs where we go into this kind of thing. Oh, good segue. She's, yeah. in our, she's on our advisory board, so yeah. Great. consult her. Okay, so could you also give us some... Like, what are the major sources sources that we have for fructose? Because a lot of people, when they hear fructose, they automatically think that fructose is only in fruits because of the name. Mm -hmm. So, um, fructose actually has a fairly interesting history in that uh, a lot of the things that we eat nowadays are things that either didn't exist before in the diets of sort of Western people, or they're in much different quantities than before. So there was this link going around on uh, Facebook a month or two ago about the changing American diet. And I think it applies to all European and American um, or North American countries. So uh, for example, wheat is not categorically a bad food. You know, um, gluten uh, depends on dosage, like everything, but um, wheat is not categorically bad. But wheat is different. Our modern wheat is different. Plus, um, I don't remember the exact number, but the the modern Western intake of wheat is somewhere around 130 pounds a year, um, which is a ton because it was like a tenth of that, you know, a couple centuries ago. So similarly, uh, fructose comes from fruit originally and honey. Those are really the only two sources. Now, honey was always a prized food throughout humanity. Um, you know, bees try to guard their honey, but they can't outsmart us. So we'll always get honey when we can. We'll cultivate bees when we can, except they're dying off now. Um, and then there is some controversy about fruit. Originally, people said... Uh, you know, we ate a lot of starches and not a lot of fruit because we diverged from monkeys who are fruit eaters and we became these meat and starch eaters. Um, and then the fruit that was available back when was not very sweet, uh, you know, and the fruit that we eat now is cultivated to be sweet. So it has a lot more sucrose and fructose. So uh, then the views kind of changed in that people said, well, you know, think about what fruit is. Fruit wants to be eaten, you know, so it can spread its seed. And there are naturally sweet fruits in places that are not cultivated, like in Africa, for example. So I think the truth is kind of between those two extremes. Um, so some types of fruit, like mango, um, they have been cultivated a bit, but they're, they've always been extremely sweet. Um, on the flip side, there's things like strawberries. So like the modern strawberry was originally cultivated in France, uh, northwestern France in Brittany. And it was a combination of a strawberry from, I think, South America or something and some other strawberry. And it created a much sweeter strawberry fruit, much bigger and plumper and juicier as well. So if you take an older strawberry and eat it, you'd be like, you know, this, this is the worst strawberry I've ever eaten. Whereas if you take a modern strawberry, most people love modern strawberries. So um, I think we do get even more fructose from fruit than we used to get from fruit. But that isn't to say that people didn't eat much fruit before because we have a fairly um, low threshold for detecting sweetness on our tongue. So like, uh, you know, everything that we eat and find that tastes good has a reason. Um, you know, obviously the reason that what, why sweet tastes good is because it's a fuel source. Uh, but the reason why savory tastes good, the reason why MSG tastes good is because it's an indicator of amino acid and protein availability. Um, so, you know, MSG glutamate usually is not a bad thing unless you're hypersensitive for a reason. And everything is like that. So even like steak tastes different than chicken because steak has amino acid. Steak has more minerals than chicken does. Um, so calcium, mineral water has a different taste than tap water. Anyway, that's getting tangential off of fructose. But the point is, is that um, we've always gotten some fructose in our diet, but we get a lot more now. Uh, but the source is not fruit or honey. It's table sugar or high fructose corn syrup. Excellent. And how, uh, let's go a bit deeper into how the body actually handles fructose compared to glucose, because there's a major difference there. So could you please explain how fructose is metabolized in the body compared to glucose? Sure. So um, we get glucose from everything, you know, whether it's called glucose or not. At the most basic level, uh, 
I don't know if, if any of your, well, your podcast listeners are fairly advanced uh, compared to most podcast listeners. So you probably know uh, dextrose um, is the form of glucose that you can extract from like grapes and corn and stuff. Um, we don't get the other form of glucose, L-glucose in the diet, uh, but it actually, trivia fact, was considered as a supplement for diabetic patients because, I'll get to this later, but fructose was originally thought of as a way to get sweetness for a diabetic patient without increasing insulin, uh, but then it ran into troubles. Glucose, you know, is just what we eat anyway, but instead of dextrose, the L-glucose form is sweet on the tongue, but we can't digest it pretty much at all, so you just, you know, poop it out. So um, it would seem to be perfect as a way for diabetic patients to get sweetness without calories, um, and it's obviously not toxic like uh, maybe some other artificial things are, but uh, it's super expensive to produce. So in the next few years, at least it won't be used. Fructose and glucose are uh, both metabolized and absorbed and digested differently. So glucose, um, it's either cleaved off from um, starch or it's in a disaccharide of glucose and fructose or a disaccharide of glucose and galactose and milk. Uh, and then glucose goes through the intest or through the um, enterocyte and the intestine, uh, and then it goes through the portal vein into the liver, and then some portion of it, let's say 20%, or maybe, you know, give or take 5%, um, once it goes to the liver, goes into the liver cell, the hepatocyte. And then the rest of the glucose just, you know, gets rushed away in the blood. So the stuff that goes into the liver cells, uh, that's called first pass metabolism. And glucose is not really subject to much first pass metabolism because only that 20% or so goes into the liver cells. The rest gets, you know, rushed away in, in normal blood. So then the glucose undergoes a few steps to become energy, um, three steps specifically. And all of those steps have feedback mechanisms so that when you eat stuff that has glucose, then any of those three steps can be in inhibited if the body senses that it's getting too much glucose. So really, glucose matches your energy requirements, glucose in the liver that is. Fructose is not attuned to your energy needs. So that's the main difference between glucose and fructose. Um, glucose escapes that first, mass, first pass metabolism in the liver Fructose does not at all. The liver wants to get rid of fructose ASAP. So um, I think there's actually maybe been studies that show that fructose increases body heat a bit, um, you know, like temporary metabolic rate. And I'm hypothesizing the reason is because the liver really wants to get rid of it because it's a bit of a metabolic, not a poison, because things like uh, dinitrophenol, DNP, those are metabolic poisons and that when you eat stuff, it gets converted to heat instead of fuel. Fructose is just not a really super intrinsically healthy thing. So um, when it goes to the liver, it gets all metabolized by the liver. Um, so when it gets into the liver cell, then there's two steps for it to become energy. And neither of those enzymes in those steps are regulated by how much you're eating or your current energy intake or anything like that. So that means that the fructose that you eat, it's not regulated at your liver and it's actually doesn't do so well at your gut either in your intestine. So um, fructose in uh, one particular study, uh, even in healthy people, more than half of them had issues absorbing more than, let's say, I don't remember if it's 30 grams of fructose or something like that. So the con of that is that if you're eating a ton of fructose, then it's probably going to sit in your gut a bit more um, and then your bacteria will feed on it, which isn't necessarily a great thing. The not as bad thing is that usually people don't eat free fructose. Uh, they eat it in the form of sucrose along with glucose um, or even fruit. Like a, a piece of fruit might have 50% sucrose, 25% free fructose, 25% free glucose. So basically the end result is it's 50% glucose, 50% fructose. And then if you get multiple sources of carbohydrate, then you're occup occupying different transporters and then it's less of an issue for the huge bolus of free fructose. But that being said, a lot of fructose in the gut is generally a bad thing, and that's where stuff like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth comes into play. So if you have gut issues, eating a lot of fructose is 
pretty much never a good idea. So once the fructose is in that liver cell, then the liver cell wants to get rid of it and it will create energy. So it'll either create ATP, um, it'll shunt the fructose into glycogen storage, or it'll make lactate, um, which will then go into muscles to be used as fuel. Um, the fructose in and of itself cannot be used by the muscles as fuel. So um, when athletes eat fructose, it's not really to um, increase stores of glycogen in muscle or anything like that. Um, and then a very small percentage of the fructose in the liver cell becomes fat through a process called de novo lipogenesis. Excellent. And a little bit back to the topic, because you said that fructose was marketed towards uh, diabetic patients because of the lower insulin response compared to glucose. And I remember that when uh, there was a real push for this in, in the industry, that you had a lot of these fructose uh, packages that was marketed towards diabetic. But what started the, the fear of uh, fructose consumption? Because like you said, we like theoretically, it wasn't a, a good idea to substitute the glucose for that population. But then mm. people started to run into problems. So could you please explain what actually what of the concerns that actually popped up? So uh, there were research concerns when fructose started to be um, seen as a potential aid for diabetic patients, and then studies didn't really pan out. But I think the main things that started fructose phobia were, um, you know, number one, I'd say is uh, Robert Lustig is a great researcher. He's a smart guy, but his YouTube video got, you know, I don't know how many millions of views, and uh, it was not totally evidence supported. Um, and it was a continuation of in the eighties, there was this book by uh, John Yudkin, uh, pure white and deadly about how sugar is bad. And then fast forward 15 or 20 years. And then now we have the internet and everybody who's interested in nutrition sees this video by Robert Lustig. Um, that's uh, talking about all the bad things associated with fructose and how it's basically a poison. So my personal viewpoint is somewhere in between. So this isn't a dichotomous variable. It's not that fructose is bad or it's good. So um, industrially made trans fats are bad. Um, uh, some things are good in certain doses. Everything else is in between. Fructose is squarely in between good and bad. So um, the video, the Robert Lustig video, uh, shows all these possible bad things from fructose. Um, and then people at the time were really getting onto low carb diets, which is the second factor. So when you combine the Robert Lustig type thing with people getting on low carb diets, because the 80s was all fat phobia. So then once you get away from fat phobia, because people are like, oh, maybe omega threes are good, or oh, maybe even saturated fats, not so bad, then you need to grab onto something to be afraid of. So does thing up. So there's Lustig, there's low carb diets. Um, and then I think the the third thing, those two things are for people who are into nutrition and who listen to podcasts. The third thing was high fructose corn syrup. So high fructose corn syrup uh, started to be used more and more in the 70s and then 80s was huge. Um, and then 90s, it's just kind of normal to use fructose, high fructose corn syrup because it's cheaper. So only countries like, you know, Mexico use sugar in their Coke. Um, and then a lot of other countries use high fructose corn syrup. So it's uh, the corn industry realized their mistake way too late and started calling it corn sugar, but um, they already kind of screwed up and called it high fructose corn syrup, which is a misnomer because it's not high fructose. It's generally about 55% fructose, uh, whereas sucrose is 50% fructose, so not much different. Um, and then it's just a long name. You know, when, uh, when you want to get people scared of something, you make the name long. Like, uh, you know, uh, fats or fatty acids don't sound so bad, but mono and diglycerides sound bad. Uh, corn sugar doesn't sound bad, but high fructose corn syrup sounds bad. So high fructose corn syrup is not bad. It's not really any different than sucrose. Um, you know, the it is free fructose and glucose, but those don't act differently in the intestine. And really the thing that matters is what happens when they get to your liver, which we already talked about. So Lustig, um, low carb diets and high fructose corn syrup was a perfect storm. And that's really what caused fear of fructose. Before then, like I said before, it was basically all fruit. And uh, I don't think the internet, you know, and, and kind of 
writings were around back in the 16th and 17th century, but I think there maybe was a, a bit more kind of grandparents fear, like don't eat too much sugar, because around that time, um, beverages start having sugar. So before the 16th and 17th century in Europe, you would get sugar from fruit and that's it because there weren't a ton of honeybees around. Uh, but then when tea, coffee, uh, and then eventually chocolate and cocoa started being imported from um, the West, then you need to sweeten those things up or else they taste like crap. So when you sweeten those up with sugar and then the trade routes start making it so that you can get sugar cane from India, then sugar consumption went way up. So that was the first spike in sugar consumption, beverage sugar. Um, and then it took another two to three centuries to get the, the huge increase in sugar from the ability to combine sugar with processed food. Um, and I think that's about as high as the sugar intake is going to get because you can't get much more sugar without just feeling really crappy in your intestine. And then you know it's bad. So this is we're at the peak, I think, right now of fructose phobia and fructose consumption. Excellent. And is there a is there a is there a limit that people recommended that people shouldn't go above in regards to fructose consumption? Yeah, so um, it's a bit interesting depending on who you talk to because, uh, like, when we were doing our study and I was looking at previous studies, then uh, it's hard when you're not doing the study to be in the to be in the shoes of the researcher. So. A researcher will present at a conference about fructose and then you look at his or her um, uh, disclosure statement and they'll be funded by like Coca-Cola and Monsanto. So they'll say, oh, well, the study's crap. Well, it's not necessarily crap because who's going to fund all these well-controlled fructose studies that have enough patients in order to get statistical, statistical significance? You know, nobody. So. Um, on the one hand, there's that, you know, just because they're funded by somebody or have been paid speaker fees doesn't mean that that's bad. On the other hand, if you look at some of the more like uh, review papers or editorials or stuff, um, I think they're too like, oh, there's no problem with fructose. If anything, fructose is good. Now, those researchers, I think they may mean it. You know, it, it might it might be their personal viewpoint, but you can't write negative fructose um, guidelines if you receive most of your money from Coke or whoever. So if they say that, you know, an intake of 50 grams a day of fructose is totally harmless, I'd say don't believe them. Uh, because the answer, the truth is that we don't know how much fructose is healthy or unhealthy. And the reason is because there's been a lot of research into metabolic effects of fructose. But the main issue with fructose is not the metabolic effects. The main unknown issue is when you eat fructose with or without certain levels of glucose, then what is the effect on future food consumption? Because the main drivers and studies of ill health, metabolic syndrome and whatever from fructose are not from the fructose in and of itself. It's from the downstream effects of fructose. Does it increase eating later on? Does it have some uh, insulin sensitivities, sensitivity issues in the liver over the course of months? It's never over the course of weeks. So um, even a pretty big dose of fructose, like 80 or 100 grams, isn't that bad over the course of a month. It's really over the course of many months. And those trials just cost too much. So I'd say, um, so the, the current average intake of fructose in America is, I think, around 55 grams a day. So uh, that's a moderate amount, but it's not as high as you might think. The issue is that that masks variability. On the top end, like the, the top quintile or whatever, um, those people are eating like 80 grams, you know, 90, even 100 grams of fructose a day. That's enough to match the fructose overdosing studies. So those people are screwed because they're going to get fatty liver. They're going to have intestinal problems. Their um, their body's eventually going to shut down as they get older. So um, I'd say a, a kind of safe range might be 20 to 50 grams. Um, and you shouldn't have fear if you eat around 30 grams. That seems normal to me. Okay, excellent. A follow-up question to that is, like uh, we talked about the amount, but there, is there a difference if you, for example, consume it from fruit compared to pure fructose form? Yeah, there is. So um, as far as I've seen, there's never been a study linking fruit to bad health. 
It would have been like an in vitro study or something, but no real clinical trial over weeks or months. And that's because of a few things. So, you know, they always say, um, you know, fruit's good and juice is bad. Don't feed your kids juice or else they're going to get dental caries and they're going to get diabetes and whatever. Uh, like most pieces of nutrition advice, that's false because juice is not intrinsically bad. Um, it's be it's because it's f from fruit that it's not nearly as bad as even a higher dose of sugar from Coke. And the reason is that um, when you look at studies of like orange juice, now granted, most of these are funded by the orange juice industry, but I don't think they're that evil. So the orange juice that you drink, um, it's been shown to, in moderate amounts, decrease the amount of endotoxin produced by bacteria in your gut, which is extremely important because that endotoxin, um, aka LPS, aka lipopolysaccharide, um, it's bits and pieces of the bacteria uh, in your gut that generally you don't want around and causes inflammation and then bad stuff later on. So orange juice, if taken with, you know, like a steak or something, not that I'm saying you should eat steak with orange juice, although that could taste good maybe for breakfast, that actually the fat from the steak could increase the permeability of your intestine and then it could increase the amount of those bacterial bits that get through so that's bad. But the orange juice will suppress that. So they don't know all the mechanisms yet, but because it's fruit, it's related to um, phytochemicals in the fruit, and you don't get that from other sugary beverages. So I'm not saying you should drink juice all day every day, but fruit is generally healthy. Overdoses of fruit are not really ever seen. Um, and the people who should watch out for fruit are the people with intestinal issues not the people with metabolic issues. The people with intestinal issues need to watch out for the fruit because of the fiber. Um, because you can never be sure what types of fiber your gut bacteria, your personal gut bacteria like and they don't like. So you should titrate up your dose of fruit if you have intestine issues. Otherwise, you know, eat fruit till the cows come home. Excellent. Yeah, because uh, I think this is a very good um, thing to talk about because people, when they hear fructose, it, the fear made people eat uh, like eliminating fruits from from their diets but they didn't really eliminate the other sources to fructose that we have in our uh, our diet but if like hypothetically if we were to say like the upper limit is 30 to 50 grams of fructose a day if you were to consume that from fruit how much fruit are we talking about um you know the studies that uh look at different doses of fructose and health that's kind of where I base this 30 to 50 from, which I'm not sticking to. I'm just throwing that out there. Fruit, uh, there's people who, you know, probably some of your readers have logged all their food intake, you know, on MyFitnessPal or Chronometer or whatever to see what the fructose adds up to. I think you can eat, you know, tons of fruit and still be healthy because it doesn't affect any known parameters. So it doesn't negatively affect blood sugar, doesn't negatively affect lipids, um, doesn't negatively affect body weight. It's possible that if you eat only fruit that you'll get too much triglyceride because triglyceride is the one thing that you can reliably increase by eating fructose. I think uh, the lowest doses that have been seen are maybe 40 grams or so, um, and it increases triglycerides a lot more in heavier people than it does in lighter people. But still, that is that's the one thing that could possibly happen. But with uh, with other people, so males and females who exercise, along with all premenopausal females, fructose is fairly beneficial. Um, because those people tend to have good results from clinical trials much more so than older people or men who don't exercise. So when you metabolize fructose and you're somebody who exercises, like I said before, that lactic acid can be used by your working muscle. So then the liver is not so worried about your fructose that you eat. And that can improve physical performance, so that's good for you as well. Um, and another thing is that fructose is much better at uh, contributing to glycogen within the liver than glucose is. So if you're using up your glycogen and you want to refuel your liver, um, then it's great. You know, eat, eat a bunch of fruit if you can handle it. And even other than those two groups of people, um, this is kind of a touchy issue because people with uh, blood sugar issues, especially people with advanced type 2 diabetes, need to really control their blood sugar or else they'll have bad stuff happen. But 
uh, if you eat a certain dose of fructose, I don't remember what it is, 30 grams or something a day, and you have poor blood sugar regulation, then you can get about a 0.5% uh, reduction in your HbA1c. Now, that's not 0.5%. This is 0.5 out of like your HbA1c is 6.2, you know, minus 0.5. That's a huge absolute decrease in HbA1c. And that's just from eating enough fruit to provide a catalytic effect of, you know, then you're not just eating glucose. You also have other transporters working um, and you don't have of high of insulin increase after meals. So you get that benefit for HbA1c without having the adverse effect on triglycerides, without having increased body weight, without any of the other bad stuff. So fruit is almost universally a good thing. Interesting. So to, um, to, to, to sum it up a bit, you, you mentioned that you did um, a, a meta-analysis on fructose and I think it also was um, high fructose corn syrup consumption in yeah. regards to um, uh, liver health. Could mm -hmm. you could you please explain what uh, what your findings were in that study and what you were what you were looking for? Sure. So we wanted to look at high fructose corn syrup, free fructose, and sugar sweetened beverages. So those are the main things that contain fructose, and then see what their effect was on liver health. And uh, the way we estimated that is liver enzymes, um, AST and ALT. Um, and then also liver fat, which isn't so easy to capture. And like 21 randomized trials that fit the criteria and two ob observational studies. So the observational studies, you know, it's important to kind of get a grasp of things, but those studies weren't very good in the first place. Out of the randomized trials, we found some decent amount of evidence that linked overfeeding of fructose to worsen liver health and increase fat. But only in the context of overfeeding fructose above and beyond your normal calorie intake. So what that means is that for an average person worrying about their fructose intake, they're not going to go on a diet that has their current calorie intake and then add in 30 grams of fructose a day in free fructose form. They're going to eat fructose with meals. Um, now, some of the studies did look at sugar and sugar sweetened beverages and stuff, but you really have to eat a lot more fructose. Um, in order to get uh, bad physical effects. Now, that isn't to say that fructose is not bad. It's just the evidence was not very high quality. Um, and uh, the populations are all different. So meta-analysis is good in that there's all these disparate studies and you need to group them together to get an overall picture. And that overall picture that we found is that overfeeding fructose can be bad, uh, but only if it leads to extra calories. So... This is, again, this is where the rubber hits the road. I hate that term, but this is the crux of the issue. Um, people are always going to say, oh, I read these studies and it only shows that fructose is unhealthy in, in studies that are not isocaloric, you know, in studies that add fructose above your calories. So that's what I thought for years. I was like, oh, fructose isn't that bad. But we don't know what the effect of fructose is on food intake. As far as I know, I haven't looked at all the data recently. If it turns out that eating an extra 20 to 30 grams of fructose makes you eat an extra 200 or 300 calories a day, that's substantial. It's never going to be two or 300 calories. but um, And that's substantial because the combined bad effect from extra calories, because fructose is sweeter than glucose um, and also is not regulated by your current energy intake in the liver, those two things combined mean that our appetites probably are not as well regulated when we eat more fructose. So that combined with the bad effects of fructose independently, um, like advanced glycation end products, increased probability of inflammation, that kind of stuff, makes it so that people who have metabolic disorders, people who are older, people who are overweight, people who have um, health conditions should watch out for too much fructose. People who are athletes, people who are healthy, uh, people who exercise a lot don't have to worry as much. Um, and then athletes specifically should think about eating a bit more fructose uh, because it could replenish liver glycogen. Excellent. And uh, in regards to gut health as well, I've seen like when we talk about um, the food map for um, for IBS, usually it's recommended that you consume if you consume fruits, is it's the fruits that contains more glucose than fructose because they seems to co seem to cause uh, GI 
issues for for uh, people with IBS. But um, over to I would I would moderately back that, but but not fully, because at a clinic that I worked at uh, a few years ago, the physician did a quantified self tracking program with the patients, mm -hmm. um, and then I would work with the patients to see what medications they were taking along with the food they were eating. And this is what I found in my N equals, you know, 20. Uh, people will go on low FODMAP diets and they'd be like, I'm going to stick to this low FODMAP diet, um, you know, over, over two months and see if it helps me. But I had this patient who, ate, who loved grapes and grapes are pretty much 50% fructose, 50% glucose. So perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Grapes were the worst offender for their irritable bowel. And it can't be the glucose fructose ratio. It can't be the fiber because grapes have very little fiber. So then, you know, what is it? I don't think researchers really know. So I'd say if you're going to go on a low FODMAP diet, then go on low FODMAP plus very high personalization. You know, if after like two times the equal glucose fructose fruit isn't helping, ditch it and go to something else. And if a high fructose fruit is helping, keep eating it. Um, it's really just a very general guideline to go by. Yeah, and I totally agree. I used to work with, used to work at a medical clinic, so I had a lot of IBS patients, and I totally agree with your your view on that. And that sometimes when you're working with the food map diet, and you you see foods that usually trigger symptoms, and people actually don't get the reactions from it, but then you switch them over. Like for example, lactose is something that people that have IBS should limit or reduce but uh, i've had i've had a couple of patients that even reacted just to 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 dairy even though they didn't have an allergy so that was also ditched from from the diet yeah i think uh when people go to some physicians or dietitians then some some guidelines are too strict because the physician or dietitian or researcher thinks that they know more than they do we don't know shit about the microbiome. Um, you know, it's going to be like 20 years until we do. So, you know, people know a lot about sets and reps at the gym. They know a lot about what refills liver glycogen. They don't know anything about what happens at the intestine. So that kind of stuff, you know, personal experience is much better usually than research. Yeah, excellent. Excellent point. So um, last question, because this is my, like, this is my area in regards to sports nutrition, because... Um, it's been over the last couple of years. It's been more popular to use fructose, especially during um, like during um, competitions. If you are supposed to consume a high amount of carbohydrate during a race, for example, mm -hmm. people have started to use a ratio between glucose and fructose instead of just using um, only glucose. Could you explain a bit about that? The reasoning behind it. Yeah. So. Um... Fructose and glucose use different transporters, and then fructose is catalytic for glycogen in the liver. So typically when you do a trial and you include some fructose, then the endurance athlete, usually it's an endurance athletics, performs better. I don't think this is really the case with anaerobic activity, but I, I could be wrong because I haven't read the literature in a while. But one of the barriers to... Uh, something like you know a 5k race or a marathon or especially ultra endurance is liver glycogen depletion um, liver glycogen depletion sucks because uh, then you get hypoglycemia and then you hit a wall and you can deplete liver glycogen very easily I think a typical person has what 150 grams of um, sugar in their liver and then that if you don't pay attention especially to your diet the day before you can half that uh, amount of sugar. So then you're down to like 75. And then you're using that liver glycogen during your event and then suddenly you're down. So if you're going to use like a gel, you know, a carbohydrate gel or something, then um, there's been studies looking at different amounts of glucose and fructose, the ratio. So you could get something like, uh, you know, almost 100% fructose, almost 100% glucose, you're never going to actually find a gel with almost 100% fructose. I'm just saying that for um, hypothetical reasons. And then somewhere in between, like 50-50. So um, I don't know if there's been a meta-analysis on this, but if you kind of put together the data yourself, then it's most likely that a predominantly glucose-fueled gel 
and a bit less fructose will lead to the highest rate of glycogen synthesis. So uh, 70, 30 glucose, fructose or something like that. So that will maintain blood sugar, maintain liver glycogen, um, and then probably lead to a bit lower chance of stomach upset than if you ate all fructose or all glucose, which you would never do of either of. But, um, and this is a case where, uh, again, I've seen this mostly during endurance athletics, but um, people's pre-race diets are interesting because uh, the evidence is, is not that strong for any particular food. So then some people just go for powdered stuff. So um, dextrose is actually absorbed very well. So that's a very safe thing to do. Maltodextrin is pretty much as well. Um, some people will eat like a banana or something, you know, which, which has both fructose, glucose, and starch. Um, and if that's safe for them, that's great. But if you're new to racing, I don't think eating a banana is great. But then we saw, sometimes we, uh, look at these studies for our research digest at examine.com. And we saw this one, there's this research lab that always like tests a new food, uh, for pre-race and they tested pistachios. Um, and it turned out that pistachios was like the worst thing to eat before a race. And that was because of, I think, ironically enough, uh, things like fructans. I don't know if it's specifically fructose or um, some some other type of um, fructan-like substance, but that messes with your gut. And the more gut distress you have, the worse you do during a race. So it's probably equally important to refuel your liver and make sure that you don't have stomach distress during your athletic activity. Yeah, I totally agree. And this is a area that I focus a lot with my endurance athletes. That we try to find a strategy for foods that do doesn't cause um, stomach upset. And we usually do this in, in training. We don't do it for the first time in competition because yeah. some, sometimes you, you eat stuff during your, uh, your season out of competition and you don't react to it. But because of stress and the nerves and stuff like that, things start to mess up in the system. Um, so we try to do all the testing before competitions. That's really smart. I actually haven't seen that much, but, uh, you know, people go off of clinical trials a lot of the time, but like those conditions don't match the conditions of a given person. So you really need to test something out in a competition like state. So yeah, very clever. Yeah. We always, uh, we always do that. And, and one of the strategies that we are actually do is lower fiber intake, uh, a couple of days in advance. We usually lower, uh, like dairy, lactose containing dairy products, we try to eliminate that. And we also uh, pay attention to to um, like fructose and stuff like that because that also mm. seems to cause problems. And another thing is like the source of caffeine because I have some athletes that can handle high amounts of caffeine in, in supplement form. But as soon as they start to... Uh, consume caffeine from beverages like coffee for example they start to get some symptoms from that yeah so, you know i i uh we were writing something about, about caffeine a couple years ago and i saw there was a, a paper talking about potential mechanisms for why you have to some people have to poop after drinking coffee yeah. and uh, i think the guy said that um they had always thought that it was purely the caffeine but it turns out it's probably the caffeine plus other stuff in the coffee um, and you can't replicate that stuff in a supplement. So, you know, people will think, oh, uh, you know, if, if I take my no dose or whatever other caffeine supplement, I'm fine. Then they drink coffee before a race. And then within 20 minutes, they have to poop and they're screwed. So, um, yeah, supplements versus food. That's a pretty interesting topic. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Uh, the, the one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, uh, follow up uh, in regards to fructose consumption during exercise is that this is a topic that has been like um, misunderstood in regards to sports nutrition because if you're um, if you're going to consume up to 60 grams of uh, carbohydrate per hour it doesn't really you, you don't necessarily need to add in extra fructose but it's when you go from 60 and above like from let, let's say you're going to consume 90 grams of carbohydrates during an endurance race. That's mm -hmm. where you actually can see a benefit from using uh, a two to one ratio between glucose and, and fructose. Because you can metabolize six, up to 60 grams an hour of glucose, but 
it's above that where it's uh, the, the transporters get saturated so then you can add in fructose and you can take more advantages of that. I think Yekendrup did a study and the highest amounts that you yeah. could oxidize was 78 grams an hour. So even mm -hmm. though you can consume 90 grams, you like the limit seems to be 78. But if you look at other studies that consume 90 grams of glucose, it's it's like 60 grams. It's it's where it stopped all the time. So like one yeah. gram, gra one gram a minute. Yeah, and I trust his studies above all else. So. Yeah, 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 totally agree. Okay, Kamal, thank you so much for agreeing to do this uh, podcast. Could you please just tell us where people can find more information about you? Yeah, so uh, you can go to examine.com and just send me an email through the contact um, link there, and I respond to all emails. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash examine.com. I'm personally on Facebook at uh, slash Miranda July. Uh, it's a long story, but that's not my actual name, but that's my Facebook address. Um, and, and we love talking to people who like nutrition, sports nutrition, or dealing with their health issues or whatever. It's kind of all the same as far as research goes. So get in touch with us. Excellent. And for people that might not know, uh, examine.com is an excellent resource to use in regards to looking at research for different types of supplements and i'm so impressed with the job you guys are doing and recommended to all my students so thank you so much for doing such such a great job with with examine.com yep it's it's our pleasure we great. enjoy it so um for um, this podcast will be available as a video on YouTube, but you can now also listen to it in audio format on, um, on iTunes. And I would appreciate if you shared and commented on the video and um, spread, it, spread it a bit around so people can um, listen to the great knowledge that Kamal has given us today. So Kamal, once again... Thank you so much for taking the time to do this podcast and I wish you a pleasant day. Yeah, I just want to uh, repeat basically what you said. This is probably the most underrated podcast out there. So um, it would be a great service to everybody to send a link because um, more people should probably be listening. Thank you so much, Kamal. Have a nice day. You too.